This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder, and I'm here with our Transformation Bible Study. And this morning, we are talking about the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem. This is our 30th day of our 30 days of transformation. Tomorrow, God willing, we'll have... <laughs> Tomorrow, God willing, we'll have one more Bible study, and tomorrow's Bible study will be just a recap of the 30 days. Literally, we're going to take the first slide of all 30 days and just go through those for you. And I just appreciate you guys. I appreciate the family. I, I appreciate the coming together to make this thing happen. It took a lot of people to make this happen. I would thank all of you right now, but we don't have time this morning. But I just want to say to all the facilitators, um, Mr. Dormer, all of you who have been praying and joining us either on, on Facebook or YouTube or live on the telephone, I am thankful for your, your prayers and your presence. So as we start off in the New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, let's pray. Dear Father, be with us for the next few moments. Give us wisdom, give us mercy, give us your grace. Amen and amen. So for those of you who are watching the video, what you can see there is an image of an artist's depiction of the New Jerusalem. On the bottom, it looks like a rainbow. There are colors on the bottom of New Jerusalem because the Bible says, the Bible says at New Jerusalem that each one of these tears that you see there represents some precious emerald, some precious stone, some precious ruby. And because the Bible says that the city is of transparent gold, and Christ himself is there, and he is brighter than the noonday sun, in essence, right above the New Jerusalem is a big rainbow, a big rainbow. The same rainbow that appeared when after the flood, he promised Noah that he would never destroy the world by flood again, a rainbow appeared, a rainbow appeared. The reason he gave them the rainbow, it was a sign of his covenant, the sign that he is a promise keeper. So in heaven for all eternity, we'll have a beautiful city with a rainbow on top. Don't you know everything that God makes, the devil has a imitation version, everything. Everything that God makes, the devil has an imitation version and the imitation version of, of heaven and its rainbow is Disney. You ever see the Disney castle and it has the rainbow going on top? It is the devil's imitation of what the father has. He wants to make you believe that what God tells you is real is make-believe and make you believe that what, make, what you see as make-believe in Hollywood is real. You better anchor your trust and your belief and your hope in this Bible. Because the Bible says that's the only thing that is true. Psalms 119, verses 142. This is truth. John 8, 32. The truth to do what, everybody? It will set you free. Now, as you look at this picture again, you see these, um, these gates. And these gates, the Bible says, is each gate is a single pearl. Ladies, y'all like pearls around your neck? Can you imagine a pearl the size of a city gate? A pearl 113 feet high, one single pearl, how awesome that must be. Y'all gonna have to use your Holy Ghost imagination with me today. You're gonna have to use it. Hopefully you got one. At least until y'all can see this stuff on, on the internet. Until you can see it on the internet. So before we get to heaven, we gotta look at what the Bible says is gonna happen before then. Right? So first, the Bible tells us that there is going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection at the end of time when, when Christ comes back again. There's going to be a resurrection. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17 says, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive will meet them in the air. And it says not a lot of people are going to be saved. I mean, there are going to be a lot of people in heaven, but when he comes back again, many people won't be ready for him. If you look at Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, it tells you, it says, narrow is the road that leads to salvation, and few there are that find it. Most of us want to do our own thing. We also see that there's going to be a millennium, meaning a thousand year where the saints who are redeemed will rule with Christ in heaven. 
a thousand years where the saints will rule with Christ in heaven. Uh, you find that in Revelation 20, verses four through six. It says after that thousand years that Christ is now going to raise up the wicked who are dead, and now it's time for them to be judged. That's called the second death, the second death. Revelation 20, verses 5, also Ezekiel 37, verses 1 to 14. That is the second death. And after that, the Bible says that heaven will come down to earth. This will become headquarters for the entire universe. Earth will be. My mama used to sing a song, and it went something like, Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Do you not know that wherever God is, that's heaven? When Jesus was here and walking around, we had heaven on earth. Even in the midst of hell, we had heaven. Wherever he is, that it's heaven. But the Bible says literally his, his abode in heaven will come down. And he says that he will forever abide with us. Just like with Moses, he came down to abide in the temple with men. He will do that again. He's done it before and he'll do it again. The Bible says that the way to heaven is not a narrow gate. Few there are that find it, Matthew 7, 13. Um, I, well, I like the King James Version, and it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. Don't you know one of the most scandalous streets in New York City used to be Broadway? The Broadway? That's where we had the prostitution. That's where we had the gambling. That's where the, the, um, the drug dealers hung out, the drug users. Broadway. The devil takes scripture and turns it into his own reality. He says, broad is the way, broad way. But he says, narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and few there are that find it. Why is it that so few of us will find life? Because we want to do it our own way. You know, even the whole thing that we talked about with the Sabbath, I told you, 99.99% .99 of the world, even though it doesn't say anywhere about Sunday, they're going to do it because it's the broad way. That's what everybody else does. You know, even though the Bible doesn't say anything that about people after they die are sort of becoming spirits and walking around in heaven, we, and the Bible says everything completely opposite against it, we believe it because that's the broad way. Most people preach that. And if you don't read your word, you won't know any difference. A lot of us believe that we speak in, in languages that even heaven can't understand. And we preach that in our churches and people believe that that is a sign of, of being saved where the Bible says, look at your fruit, right? You look at your, your love, your joy, your long suffering, your peace, your gentleness, your goodness, your kindness. Those are your fruit. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, meaning that you keep these 10 commandments and you do what Jesus did. You follow, you follow his example. Broad, broad is the way to hell, and narrow is the way to heaven. The Bible tells us that a time of trouble is coming, a time of trouble, meaning that something is going to happen in these last days that are going to make it really difficult for all of us. The Bible tells us that it's coming. And what are some of those things that are indicators? Because Christ gives us some way marks to look out for. He gives us some way marks. In Matthew 24, verses 3 to 8, and it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and at the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, if Jesus is telling you to be on the lookout, that means that most of us are going to be deceived. He wouldn't give you the lookout if it wasn't going to happen. Remember he told Peter, he said, Peter, you are going to deny me three times before the, the, uh, the rooster crows twice. You are going to deny me. Peter said, no, I'm not. Jesus said, yes, you are. Peter said, no, I'm not. Jesus said, yes, I, yes, you are. He got the warning, and he still did what Jesus warned him about. So here we find in Matthew 24, 4, that Jesus warns them. It says, take heed. That means be alert that no man deceive you. He says, for in my, in my name, many will come and say that I am Christ, and they shall de deceive many. Well, Pope Pius, Pope Pius XI said 
You know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the vicar of Christ, which means I am God on earth. This is Pope Pius XI. Adultery is a God dishonoring practice. In Isaiah 42, verse 8, it says, I am Yahuwah, that is my name. I give my glory to no one else, nor my praise to graven images. If you go to a lot of churches, you find these graven images that people are bowing down and they're praying and they're weeping and putting flowers in front of dead statues. Also, you have, you have at the Catholic Church, they, they have a golden cup right, that they use for their communion service or Eucharist that they also have a little wafer. And this wafer is round and it represents the same wafer that the Egyptian priests used. They consecrated this round wafer, this cake, that was supposed to become the flesh of Osiris. And the roundness of the cakes was supposed to symbolize the sun, which fitted well for Osiris as the sun deity, but it doesn't work when you're trying to use that to say that it's Christ. Because they tell you every time you eat that wafer, you, you eat Christ of flesh. You eat his flesh again. And so pagan practices have come into the church. He says, be careful. We've already talked about Sunday and sun worship, but, but be careful. Verse 6, and he says, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Those of you who are monitoring the news, you know that Trump said he's got $50 billion. He's setting up a new missile station in the North Pole so he can shoot down missiles for any country anywhere from the North Pole. Wars and rumors of wars. We're just waiting for the next thing to, to crack off. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there should be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. You know what diverse places mean? Places that, that, that are not used to having this. We're going to have earthquakes where you're not used to having earthquakes, like in Mexico. Have had an earthquake not, not too long ago in Delaware. We have earthquakes where people are not used to having. We have in famines where people are not used to having famines. And he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of sorrows. The Bible also tells us in these last days, according to Matthew 24, this is Jesus telling them what's going to happen right before he comes back. He says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. When he says for my name's sake, that means that you taking on his character, you doing what he did. That's how they know that you're like him and that you're going to be hated because of that. Despite what the prosperity preachers tell you, that you're going to have a big house and a big car and a fat bank account, he said, if you follow me, take up your cross. And he says, and, they sh and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. According to the Bible, inside, um, the Bible Museum that they have in downtown DC, the gospel has gone almost to every single person on the planet. He says, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. What was the abomination of desolation Daniel preached about? He says, when pagans bring idols into the temple of God. It happened in AD 70, in AD 70, when the Roman emperor um, sent his soldiers to crush the, the, the Jewish rebellion. And they literally, soldiers went in there and they placed their, they placed their flags, which represented their gods, and on their flags were eagles. The Roman eagle was on the flag, which represented the God that they worshiped. They set it down in the middle of the temple. And according to the people, the temple had now become abominable. What are we now bringing into the temple to make it abominable, to make it a place of abomination? In verse 20 of Matthew 24, it says, but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. This is Jesus giving a future prophecy 
about right before he comes back, right? He's also talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which happened about 54 years after him. But he's also given a double prophecy about this last day time, this last tribulation that's coming. He was doing double talk. Don't let your flight be in the winter. Neither on, he didn't say any day of the week, neither on the Sunday. He says neither on the Sabbath day, which means that Christ expected the Sabbath to still be going on long after he was gone. It says, for then shall be a great tribulation such as, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall there ever be. We call that a rough time. For all of the bad things that have happened in this world, he says, when it gets down to the end, it's going to be like it never was. Never was. He talks about these plagues and revelation that are coming like it never was. Now, the Bible says in Matthew 23, 9, do not call anyone father. That means your spiritual father. Matthew 23, 9, do not call anyone on earth your father for one in your, in your, for one is your father who is in heaven. They call the Pope right now the Holy Father, the Holy Father. Presidents call them Holy Father. Presidents bow to him and kiss, kiss his ring, Holy Father. And every time people do that, it is a disrespect to the real Heavenly Father, the real Holy Father. We better be careful with these preachers and priests that whatever we do in and worship in that is lining up with this word. In Matthew 24, 22 to 29, it says, then if there be, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch as if possible they shall deceive the very elect. Pope Pius X in 1835, he was the Pope from 1835 to 1914, uh, 19, Pope Pius X said, the Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself under the veil of flesh. So when he says many Christ, each of the popes believe that they are Christ incarnate. Each of the Christ, that's what they are preaching. They are God men. They call themselves infallible. It says in 1 John 2, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the father and the son. And Webster's 1828 dictionary defines deny as to contradict, to gainsay, to declare a statement or position not to be true. When Pope Pius X declared the Pope is not simply the representative of Christ, on the contrary, he is Christ himself. The Pope is denying Jesus Christ by proclaiming to be him. The other thing that it says in Matthew 24, verses 26, it says, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert. You know, people are going to say Christ is somewhere in, in some, some foreign place or in some, some hidden wilderness. He says, do not go. Behold, if they say he's in secret chambers, believe it not. As we get closer and closer to the last days, people are going to keep saying Christ is here, Christ is there, and everybody's going to swarm because they think they're going to get the healing that the lady got with the issue of blood. He tells us in verse 27 of Matthew 24 how he will return. You ready? He says, for as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He's saying, everybody's going to see me. When lightning flashes across the sky, I could be in New York, you could be in Delaware, we see the same lightning flash. As lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Meaning that you will visually see it, not some secret rapture. In Matthew 24, verses 30 to 35, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Now, angels blowing trumpets are not like people blowing trumpets. You got to remember, these are holy beings. The Bible tells us that one angel slew 185,000 soldiers in the Old Testament in one night. These are trumpets that rise up people from their very graves. And it says, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. 
And Jesus says, now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. He knows that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. We are supposed to be able to see the signs. What does he mean when he says, see the signs? See the prophecies. They're in Daniel and in Revelation. If you don't get anything else from all of the Bible studies that we've done, you have got to read Daniel and Revelation. Pick up a good book. There are a lot of good books that help explain Daniel and Revelation. One of the best is by a guy named Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith about Daniel and Revelation. He wrote it in the 1800s. It's still a pretty solid book about Daniel and Revelation. It says, therefore, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Fulfilled means prophecy coming about. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The Bible tells us to look forward to the second coming, the second coming, the second advent. The first advent, he came as a child. That was the first advent. The second advent means that he's coming back, and this time he's not coming back like a baby. He's not coming back in swaddling clothes. He's coming back like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church, the grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. Literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven, but the unrighteous will die. The Bible says that his coming, they will say rocks and mountains fall on us. From the very brightness of his coming, people will die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy together with the present condition of the world indicates that Christ's coming is imminent, meaning even at the door. The time of the event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted to be ready at all times. We're supposed to be like those virgins. The Bible tells about five wise virgins and five foolish virgins, and the foolish virgins did not have oil in their lamp. The, because they were virgins mean that they were both Christians. They were two sets of believers. But one set had oil in their lamp, and oil in their lamp meant the Holy Spirit, and they were prayerful. And they were expecting the Savior to come back. And the other set of Christians said, we got time. We got time. When Christ came the first time, church leaders, the Pharisees, missed the first advent. But the shepherds, because, but the shepherds were there for the first advent. And the reason the church leaders missed it is because they failed to study the prophecies. Shepherds got it, and the priests missed it. Shepherds got it, and the priests missed it. The Bible says righteous living and the righteous dead will meet the Lord together. So sometimes people sing songs about mama done going on and when I get there, I'll, I'll be with you. Tell my friends I'm coming to. Nope, that's not what the Bible says. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, and here's the catcher, together, together, with them in the clouds. That means that all of us are going to get to heaven at the same time. Nobody's got to jump on you. Nobody's got to jump on you, right? You and mama, if y'all both going to make it, and she's already passed, the Bible says that he's going to call her forth, and he's going to make her brand new. Whatever she was supposed to be, whatever her form was supposed to be, she's going to come back better than ever. And it says, they shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Let me tell you, if you ever lost a loved one, you should be shouting right now. You lost a mama, a grandmama, a cousin, a sister, a baby, you know, lost a baby at childbirth. You should be shouting hallelujah right now. This is enough to end the Bible study on right here. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Forever, ever? Yes, forever, ever. The Bible says that the lawless one will be revealed or exposed, the lawless one. Lately, this big thing that we're hearing in the Christian church is that there's no law. Everybody, there's no law. Law's done away. Law got nailed to the cross. Lawless one. We find in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 and 2 Thessalonians 2.8, it says, then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. 
the man who says, you don't have to worry about the law. But the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. So some religious force is going to be in this world and, and put forth a spirit saying that the law is done away with. The Bible says that the wicked one will be revealed, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And how is it revealed? Through the word. Through the word. The Bible says that this word is like a sword. It cuts, cuts away all of the, the stuff that's not true. This word shows you the truth, John 8, 32, right? So we've got to really depend on our Bible in times like these. We got to pray, we got to fast, and we got to read this word. It indicates that the Antichrist will not reveal himself through his own actions, but another will reveal him. Another, somebody else other than him, based on 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3, and 6 to 8, their passive voice. Somebody else is going to expose him. Acts 1, 7 says, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the father has put into his own power. God has set the time, the place, and the sequence leading to the revealing of the wicked one. Right? So he's going to reveal them. No worries. The world is waking up to a whole bunch of stuff. Hebrews 9, 28 says that Christ offered once for man salvation. Once. And he did it once to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So when he comes back again, he ain't coming back like a baby. He ain't coming back weak. He's not coming back like a, like a man. He's coming back like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Won't have to be afraid of Trump then. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. John 14 verses 1 to 3 is one of the most beautiful passages of scripture in the entire Bible. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. Now, I like this word mansions because in some versions it says rooms. I like mansions. It sounds more expansive. You know what I'm saying? The rooms sound like a condo. It says, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I want to be where he is. What about you? I want to spend all eternity there. I want to walk all over heaven. I want to see every bit of it. I want to see what's in these other universes. I want to experience all of it. Revelation 22, verses 12 to 14. Revelation 22 verses 12 to 14, it says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Commandments won't save us. We talked about that yesterday. But if you don't do the commandments, you can't get into heaven either, right? So it's like, they don't save you, but you ain't getting in there without doing them. Blessed are they that do his commandments, for they will have the right to the tree of life. As you're looking at this picture, what you see is a yellow road. That yellow is, is transparent gold, the Bible says, that the dirt is gold, it's made out of gold, the dirt, the, the floor that we walk on in heaven. And when you watch um, Hollywood, they had the Wizard of Oz. Remember the Wizard of Oz, where they're going down a yellow brick road? That yellow brick road is a mockery of what the Bible tells you what heaven is like. Because remember Dorothy and her friends, they were trying to get wisdom by going to a witch, by going to a wizard. That's what they were trying to get their, their wisdom from. And it was just talking about us. It represented all of the different types of people going to wizards or Satan to get their instruction and their guidance, to get their courage, to get their brain. They go into wizards following a yellow brick road instead of the road that leads to salvation. You know, broad is the way that leads to destruction, broad. The Bible also tells us that during that millennium, that millennium, the righteous will judge the wicked. Now, why is God going to allow the righteous to judge the wicked? The reason he's going to do that is if your mama don't make it to heaven or your baby or your daughter, or your husband, you're going to think that Christ is unjust. You're going to think that they didn't get a fair trial. And he's going to let you for a thousand years go through the books yourself. 
And trust me, when everything is said and done, you're going to go through these books and see that he extended opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to them. And that whatever decision was made at the end, he was righteous. It was the right decision. He gave them opportunity and they said no over and over and over again. Sin will never rise again. We have to be persuaded beyond doubt that the God that we serve is righteous. Remember Satan said that he is not righteous. Satan challenged his character. Satan challenged his laws. Satan challenged his government. So he's going to set the record straight. The Bible says that he keeps a book. He keeps a book. The millennium is the thousand year reign of Christ with his saints in heaven between the first and second resurrections. During this time, the wicked dead will be judged. The earth will be utterly desolate without living human inhabitants, but occupied by Satan and his angels. At his close, Christ with his saints and the holy city will descend from heaven to earth. The unrighteous dead will then be resurrected and with Satan and his angels will surround the city but fire from God will consume them and cleanse the earth. The universe will thus be freed of sin and sinners forever. Now we know according to the apostle Peter, that when, when we, the righteous are resurrected, we are resurrected with new bodies. He says that we are changed in the instant, in the moment, in the blinking of an eye, we are changed to be more like Christ, our, our physical natures. So when the wicked come back up, they're gonna come up in a state similar to what they went down. You know those zombie pictures that you see, the zombie apocalypse? That's what it's talking about. People are coming back up and they got broken legs when they went down. They had arthritis when they went down. They're going to come back up looking awful, not like us. That we are raised in the power of Christ and are raised in the power of the Father. What is the millennium? The millennium is a thousand years. It means a thousand. A thousand years Satan is bound and martyrs reign with Christ. Revelation 20 is the only place in the Bible where a thousand year reign is mentioned. So its interpretation is important. The most controversial part of Revelation, um, several widely varying views have come about about the millennium, but you have got to use the Bible as your key. We're not going to have a thousand years of peace on earth while man is reigning. We won't get that peace until Christ comes back. So you read Revelation 20. You read it. Revelation 20 uh, verses one to four says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not deceive the nations anymore till a thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Well, who is this dragon? Who is this old serpent but Satan himself? And he says, and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. These are martyrs. These are believers who died believing. They died for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So a lot of people are going to worship that beast and his image. We already talked about the, the word image is a mark or a sign. And as we read through the Bible, we already know now what is the sign of God that he keeps talking about over and over again. He says his sign is Sabbath. So the beast has his own Sabbath. He has his own mark. And it's one that he puts in your mind and in your hand. Your mind means that you're going to believe what he wants you to believe, or in your hand means that you're going to do what he wants you to do. At the end of the millennium, according to Revelation 20, verses 5 through 9, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death shall have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea. For those of you who watch movies, if you saw a movie called Avengers, the Millennium 
Infinity Wars for, for the Avengers. You saw all of those people rushing against each other. That's what it's going to look like when they come to charge the children of God who are, who are living now in the New Jerusalem. And it says, and when they went up on the breadth of the earth and it come past around the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20 verses five to nine. That is the second death. That is the final destruction. That is him having the last word. Where does the beloved city come from and how is it prepared? According to 1 Thessalonians 3.13, it says, may he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God, the Father and our Lord Jesus, when he comes with his holy ones. So this city is coming from God. And according to Revelation 21, verse 2, it says, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The bride normally wears white because it represents cleanliness. It represents righteousness. Right? And so that's what the bride has us on. The bride is his church. Represents cleanliness. Represents righteousness. Righteousness is right doing. How do we know what's right and what's wrong? The commandments. I know I talk about the fourth a lot, but all of them matter. And if you keep the first four, that talks about your love to God. And the last six talks about your love and respect for man. That's why Christ says, on these two commandments, hang all the ten. On these two, love God, love your fellow man. Right? He didn't get rid of them. He was just telling you, if you cover these two, two sets of commandments, you've covered everything. And it says that the devil, this is Revelation 20 still, verses 10 to 15. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And when he got there, the beast and the false prophet were there, and they were tormented day and night. And he says, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead. That means no matter where you died, when you died, he's going to bring you back to, to, to judge you. The fact that some wicked person, some Ku Klux Klanman, some Nazi did something and you thought they got away with it, or some cop who shot some person on the side of the road, you think they got away with it. He says, nope, I'm going to bring you back. You will be judged. There will be a judgment. There's no getting away from it. There's no getting out of it. You can't sort of pay off a priest, give a big donation to the church. And he says, and death and hell will also cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want to be in the book. I want to be in the book. We have got to get our names in that book. How do we get our names in that book? By asking Jesus Christ to be our savior, Yahshua to be our savior by asking for forgiveness out of our sins, confessing our sins and repenting. I wanna get in the book. The formula is pretty simple. The Bible tells us about a new earth, a new earth. One on, on the new earth in which righteousness dwells, God will provide an eternal home for the redeemed and a perfect environment for everlasting life, love, joy, and learning in his presence. Think about your best vacation ever. What was a perfect vacation for you? Take your perfect vacation, multiply it by 10 million, and it doesn't come close to heaven. For here, God himself will dwell with his people, and suffering and death have passed away. The great controversy will be ended, and sin will be no more. All things, animate and inanimate, will declare that God is love, and he shall reign forever. Everything will say he is love. The trees, the animals, the ground, everything will declare that he is love. 2 Peter 3.13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Right? 2 Peter 3.13. We got a heads up that a new heaven and earth is coming. Revelation 21 verses 1 to 7 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Why, did we, why was there no more sea? Do you remember when, when there was a flood? God said, I'm going to wipe out the people of earth because of a flood during Noah's time. That's where your oceans came from. 
before then, I mean, we didn't have oceans. We probably had little streams. We had little lakes. We had ponds. But there was no ocean. He caused all of that water to come about to destroy that, the earth as it was before. And now the water is two-thirds of the earth. There's more water than land. So he says, I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to put it back the way it was supposed to be. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. We got to claim him. We got to claim him. He said, listen, I'm the God who made heaven and earth. I'm the one that's going to make the new heaven and the new earth too. If you won't claim them now, what makes you think you're going to claim them later? I love these pictures for those of you who are watching online. These are some awesome pictures. These are just regular people, regular artists using their imaginations, trying to depict what the Bible says heaven will be like. It takes my breath away just watching what men were able to do. In Revelation 21, verses 11 to 13, it says, on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And it says the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations of this place. Now, I've heard some people say that only the, the black Hebrews or the Hebrew Israelites or the Israelites or the tribes, 12 tribes, will get into heaven because their names are on the 12 tribes um, or over each gate. But, you know, if you go to Jacob, I mean, go to Genesis chapter 49, go to Genesis chapter 49, and what you find there is that Jacob, who's later called Israel, exposes the character flaws of his children. For example, in Genesis 49, it says Reuben slept with his own mother. So the reason he has the 12 names of these 12 children of Jacob over each gate was, wasn't because they were holy. It was because they were floored individuals. And each one of those 12 children had a different character, a different nature. So what the Bible is saying, that, that each of us here are different. We have different types of characters, different tendencies. And even, even those different tendencies, Christ is saying, I can save them. No matter what you are like, no matter which of Jacob's 12 children, which were all very different, he says, I can still save you. That's why he put those names up as a testament that no matter what you are like, I can save you. The Bible says that there are three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Why does he put three gates on every side? The reason he puts three gates at every side is because if you look at Revelation 7, verse 9, it says a great multitude was saved out of every nation, tribe, and language. He put gates on every side to tell you that people are coming from every direction, every nation, every tribe, every language. Not just black folks, not just white folks, not just Spanish people, right? <laughs> he says every, every tribe, every nation, they're coming from all directions. Why did he put the names of the 12 apostles on the bottom of the, of the, um, on the, bottom of the, the, the cities? Why did he put their names in the foundations? Again, just like with the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 uh, disciples or apostles, they had different character types. If you go to Mark 3, 7, it says that James and John were called the sons of thunder, meaning that they brought the heat, man. When they came into the room, there was going to be a fight. They were sailors. If you go to Matthew 26, verses 69 to 70, 75, Peter denied Christ. He was, he was an impetuous person. He lied on demand as they asked him the question. There's another place where Peter pulls out a sword and he slices off somebody's ear. He didn't put their names there because they were perfect. They represented character types of people who helped to build up this kingdom. That's what they represent. Okay? Revelation 21, verses 17 and 18. And it says, The city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. When it says his length is as, as large as his breadth, it means that the city is square. It's a square city. The length and the breadth of the height are equal. 
and he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. What is a cubit? In, in Bible times, a cubit was the distance from your elbow to the top of your fist. When you made a fist, that was a cubit. It was normally 18 inches for a regular sized man. But the Bible says a cubit based on the measurement of an angel. I don't know how big an angel is. So it must be, it must, it might be much bigger than the, the, um, the size that I'm about to measure for you. I'm going to give you the sizes based on the, the Bible in a few minutes, and I'm going to let you see what it looks like. But based on a man size, that's 18 inches is a cubit. That's a cubit, 18 inches, 140 and four cubits. But it says based on the, the measurement of an angel, which I'm guessing is a lot bigger. And it says, the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. So this city, its walls are going to be like a, a crystal, you know, like the crystal chandeliers that you have that you can see through, and it, the light reflects and sparkles off of it. That's what the walls will look like, transparent gold. Here are the measurements of, of heaven, right, based on man's measurements. Remember, it says uh, cubits of an angel. So the length is 590 kilometers. For those of you who don't know kilometers, that's 367 miles is the length of heaven. The circumference of heaven, according to man's measurements, is uh, 2,360 kilometers, or uh, 1,466 miles is the circumference. That's about the size of the state of Colorado. The walls are 88 meters, or 289 feet, feet high. The area is 348,100 um 348, 100,000 square kilometers or 134,000 miles. That's the area. That is 34,810,000 hectares or 87 million acres. That's how big heaven is according to man's measurements. If every road in heaven is 50 meters, that's 166 feet. And every house block is one hectare. That's 2.5. Uh, acres in size, there would be 15,469,800 houses in heaven, 7,866 roads, 4,641,333 kilometers of roads. That is 12 times the distance from Earth to the moon. The circumference of the sun would be equal in street intersections, 15,469,800 thousand eight hundred uh, street intersections would be in heaven it's gonna be a pretty busy place man we're not just gonna be just sitting around doing nothing now granted we got the whole universe is ours but this will be our home you know as we travel and and see the other galaxies and other worlds we'll come back home you know just like you travel now and come home but when you come home there won't be no bills waiting for you right lights are still be on and such what is the housing capacity if each house had one person per story and the dining table at a great wedding supper is double-sided with one person at every meter on both sides, and there's a hundred stories in the building, that means that one, one billion five hundred and forty-six million nine hundred and eighty thousand people will fit in one hundred stories of building in heaven. That's one heck of a condo. The table, if we all sat at the table together, we would be sitting at a table 773,000 kilometers. That is the distance of the sun's radius. That's how we'll sit at a table. Remember he says we'll all sit at a table? Um, the dining table is three times the diameter of the sun. 15 billion people will have housing capacity. And the kilometer along with the dining table is five times the diameter of the sun. So that's if the building is a thousand stories. So if God decides that he's gonna build these buildings higher, 500 stories or a thousand stories, you got room for 15, 15 billion, 15 billion, 469 million, 800,000 people in housing capacity of a thousand stories. I don't know how big the place is gonna be. People are just trying to imagine based on what the Bible says, they're trying to imagine. And for those who are looking at online, look at that one room. That's a room in somebody's house, some king somewhere. That's his room. I'd be all right with a room like that. How long will it take if heaven is like earth? How long will it take? How long will things take if heaven is like earth? To spend one day exploring each building of the New Jerusalem would take 42,383 years. 
to explore each building in the New Jerusalem. To take one day meeting everyone in the New Jerusalem, assuming that there's going to be 1,548,980 million people there, would equal 4,238,301 4, years just to say hello to everybody in heaven. To spend one day exploring each square kilometer of the new earth will be equal to 1,400,500 years. That's just to spend one day exploring every square kilometer on the new earth. To spend one day exploring each square kilometer of the new earth with a different person each time would take 2,166,545,490 million years or 2.1 trillion years. It's bananas. That's 2 trillion, my bag. 2.1 trillion years it would take to explore all of heaven. But you know, the Bible says that a thousand years to God is as a day and we got all eternity. We got all eternity, ain't no rush, ain't nobody going nowhere. We won't get sick, we won't get tired, we won't die, we got wings. We can move as fast as lightning, right? All of these times and measurements are based on me and you as slow as we are. But the angels move like lightning. It says in Revelation 21 verses 19 to 21, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonyx, the sixth a sardis, the seventh a chrysolite, the eighth was beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth a amethyst. Basically, what he is giving you are, are emeralds and pearls and precious stones that equal the colors of the rainbow. If you type all of these in on the computer, they bring up all of the different shades of the rainbow. There are 12 different colors in the rainbow. And that's what heaven you will see. It's going to be bright and filled with color. That's why, the, that's why Satan has taken the rainbow and made the rainbow the symbol of, of homosexuality. They believe that it's their symbol. They have taken something sacred and made it profane. But don't worry, he's coming back to get his rainbow. He's coming back to get it. And the Bible says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, and it was transparent glass. I already told you, the city's gates are 200, the city's walls are 228 feet, 288 feet. They're bigger than the Empire State, um, uh, the Statue of Liberty, and you got a gate there that's the size of a pearl, a single pearl, is the size of the gate, a single pearl, a single pearl. Can't imagine what that's like, man. Can't imagine what kind of gleam is going to come off of a pearl. Ladies, isn't that why you guys love pearls so much? Because the way the light hits it and the way it shines off the light. So this is John, the revelator, trying to explain in his humanness what he saw. Revelation 22 verses 1 to 5 says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruit. Now, when the Bible says it yields 12 manner of fruit, it's different types of fruit grow every month. And it says, and it yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, how are we going to know that every new month is coming? Do you remember in Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, it says that we are going to come to see God every Sabbath and from every new moon to new moon. The moons are the way that they count the months. And the Sabbaths are the way that he intended for us to count the weeks. So in Revelation 22, when it says that we're going to come there to the tree of life, which bear 12 manner of fruits, that's a different manner of fruit every month based on the new moons and yield her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This is the tree that once we eat it, we'll never die. We're gonna keep growing and keep becoming more like we were supposed to be during our initial creation. There should be no more curse, the curse is death. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And, there, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they shall need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, 
and there were great voices in heaven. This is Revelation eleven fifteen. And the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And Revelation 4, verses 9 to 11, and it says, And they lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. Revelation 4, 9 to 11. Even when we get to heaven, we are going to acknowledge him as the creator. That's his seal, his sign, I'm the creator. And it says that we will cast our crowns at his feet. Don't you know he says that he has called us to be a nation of kings and a nation of priests? And so when I get to heaven, I'm going to get my crown, man. My crown, I'm going to have my new name. It ain't going to be Felder. It ain't going to be my slave name on my head. I'm going to take on my daddy's name. I'm going to take on Yahshua's name. And when I see him, this expensive crown full of gold and diamonds and precious jewels, I'm going to throw it down like a, like a baseball cap. I'm going to cast it down at his feet. I'm going to lay it down at his feet and bow and say, you alone are worthy. You are king of kings. I'm going to be a king, but he's the king of kings. I'm going to be a lord, which means a master, but he's the master of masters. And the kingdom shall be of his Christ. Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 21 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. We're going to forget about taxes. We're going to forget about things breaking in the house. And we're going to forget about child support and divorces. All of that's done, man. Being cold, being too hot. It says, But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people with joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. You will never cry again. How many times have you cried? Can you imagine never crying again, that nothing will ever cause you to tear, not even the loss of your loved ones who don't make it into the kingdom? He's going to give you so much joy, and you're going to be so confident that he did the right thing, that his truth and his justice was so righteous. That whatever decision he makes, you're going to say, just and true are you, Father. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner shall be in a hundred years old shall be accursed. What he's saying is that you're going to live longer than a tree. You know, a tree will never die. I mean, in a, in a regular environment, we kill the trees. <laughs> But a tree, if you plant it and it gets water and sunlight, it will just continue to grow. It won't die. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. This is uh, Isaiah 65, 17 to 21. We were supposed to build even before sin. We were supposed to plant even before sin. We were supposed to eat fruit before sin. Fruit is our original diet. We're going to go back to our original diet. We're not going to be in heaven chasing down the chickens and the lambs and the goats and setting up a, a Holy Ghost McDonald's, man. Isaiah 65, 22 to 25, it says, They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. You're not going to be slaving for somebody else. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Do you know that lions used to eat straw before sin? They ate grass before sin. The lions weren't eating the other animals in the garden. They're going to go back to their original diet too. And dust shall be the serpent's meat, right? Serpents can eat, eat, eat grass, eat dust, eat things off the ground, not people, not bite people. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord. Listen, that's it. That's it. I'm looking forward to that day. You know, we all should. That's why, we, that's why we, we do all of this. You mean to tell me for us to, to miss out on heaven? What, would, what is worth missing out on heaven? You know, down here on earth, we got nothing, man. We got nothing. We poor, we got nothing. Even if we think we rich, we poor. 
This is nothing to have a life that if you die in one minute, everything that you have is gone. People waiting for you to die to get your old stuff. Everything that you bought is going to break. It has an expiration date. Every piece of clothes, every piece of furniture, everything that you so value has an expiration date. And if you got jewelry, they're waiting to take it. If you got a car, it's waiting to break down. Nothing here is designed to last. I want forever. Forever, ever. I want to be with my wife and I, I want to be around her. I want to know what she looks like at a million years old. Two million years old. I want to go around and introduce myself to everybody at heaven. But when I get there, the first person I'm chasing down is the one who died for me. I'm coming for him. And I'm going to say to him, please, let me just bow at your feet. Let me just say, I adore you. Let me just cry, holy, 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 holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, there are angels in heaven. They have six wings. They take two wings to cover their eyes out of respect. They take two wings to cover their feet out of respect. They take two wings to stay afloat. And they just shout, holy, holy, holy. And here we are, sinful people won't give them no praise. Angels screaming holy, and we won't give them praise. Boy, I tell you, I can't wait. I told you that the angels don't have to take breaths. They can hold a note for 100 years, man. Can you imagine a holy? <laughs> And so the devil has a, a mockery of everything that is in the Bible. So in Isaiah 6, where the angels cry, holy, 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 it says Satan comes as Santa, and he goes, ho, ho, ho. That means I'm not going to give you full respect. Ho, ho, ho. I'm not going to give you the respect that you are due. He's got a counterfeit for everything in this Bible. Everything, there's a counterfeit. Instead of a holy, a ho. Anyway. I'm grateful. Listen, I'm going to open up the lines. If you're on the line, if you got a question, a comment, something you want to add, I appreciate you guys hanging there with us today. We have one of those days today. We have one of those days. And the devil, don't, he don't want to look at his end. He don't want to be reminded of his end. Right? So I'm going to open up the line today. Q&A session started. If you have a question or a comment, hit star six. If you plan on making it to the kingdom, feel free to hit star six. <laughs> All right. Listen, I intend to make it. I intend to make it. As you're thinking about possibly coming on, let me just tell you, tomorrow we got a recap. It'll be our final day of the 30 days of transformation. We won't, I won't be on every day um, after tomorrow. But there will be people on the line every day. We have great facilitators. We have preachers who come on the line. We have um, prayer warriors, prayer champions that come on the line. And they'll be on. They'll be on. I'll, I'll be on on Saturday and Sunday, Sabbath and Sunday. Uh, I'll go back to a regular schedule after tomorrow. So y'all only got to bear with me one more day during the week. And then you will hear some other voices much more qualified than me to really go into this word and share with you and encourage you. We need different things from different people on different days. And that's why we keep a lot of variety uh, on this uh, prayer call. Uh, I see three people in the queue. We'll open it up. And I just pray, you know, as we end this period of transformation, that your life has been changed like mine. The Bible says there's no way that we can come in touch with Christ and not be transformed. He says if he's lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. 843251, good morning. Good morning, Brother Thomas. Can you hear me, sir? Loud and clear, Doc. Loud and clear. Brother Thomas, I, I don't have words to say how much I have enjoyed this transformation. As far as the fasting, I fast for seven days. And then I went on a Sabbath fast. I, 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 that's going to be my, my new thing. I, I would like to fast through the Sabbath. Just, just for the enlightenment that we, you know, that, that's given, and just obeying him and celebrating his his day. And Brother Thomas, I pray when you uh, look around, you see me at the kingdom. Uh, I want to get there, and I don't know anything that that would keep me from 
Uh, well, Brother Jimmy, it appears that you dropped off. Um, if you make it back on the line, I'll, I'll be happy to let you back in. And uh, thank you so much. I see 301651. Um, I think that's Pastor Cox. Pastor Cox, I see Miss Roxy Smiley. I'm going to let her go first, and then I'll come to you. Hello, Miss Roxy. Hello, Brother Thomas. How are you today? I'm doing awesome and incredible, sis. How are you? Um, I'm just blessed to be on the line today. I'm just, and I just wanted uh, to let you know that. I your, uh, the lesson today is extending from what we're studying right now. It's just it's very powerful, and, and and as you have, as you're trying to reiterate to each one of us, is that we must study the word, and that Daniel Revelation is it. But then study nothing else. That's definitely get you on track. That's for sure. <laughs> I just wanted to reiterate that, and thank you for for uh, the measurements. Good Lord, I don't know where you got them from. I don't. I haven't seen them. All right, yeah, but I'm going to go back and, and um, take uh, the notes on that, those measurements, and uh, what have you. Awesome. The 24, the 24, you know about the 24? I, know I, I sure know. do. I sure do. The 24, we're talking about the 12 disciples and the, and the, and the 12 um, tribes of Israel. Is that right? Does that encompass the 24? No, ma'am. No, ma no. Uh, we now can get into that today, but I'd be more than happy to do it on any any Sabbath or Sunday. Study. I got you. I just don't want to confuse new people who are who are hearing about it for the first time. But trust me, I'd be happy to engage you on that. Okay. Okay, I appreciate that. Yes, because because it's it, it's been it's been thought upon as such, and that's why I'm trying to get clarity as well. Thank you. No worries, sis. We'll go over it. I promise you. I would, that would be a joy for me to go over that. All right, I see uh, one more caller in the queue. We'll take the last caller. And if Brother Jimmy comes back, um, we'll talk to him. But I do want to say th one thing about what Brother Jimmy said. And I, I think it's a good thing to fast. Just in the Bible um, days, what they did is they normally would not fast on the Sabbath because the Sabbath was considered to be a day of feasting. At least that's what Jesus said it was supposed to be, a day of joy. And when you fast, it's supposed to be a day of affliction, meaning that you are, you know, confess, confessing your sins and trying to get things right. So normally what they would do is, is fast on the, the um, preparation day, which is the day before Sabbath. And then on the Sabbath, it would be a day of feasting. And um, some of the Pharisees, they changed it up and they started to fast on the Sabbath day to make it a day of mourning. And that was one of the reasons when they, when they brought in Sunday worship, they said, well, we'll keep Sunday for feasting and we'll use Sabbath for fasting to make it a day of mourning. But that was never the way it was intended if you look at the, the New Testament and see what Christ did. But I'll talk to Brother Jimmy about that whenever he comes back on. But, but it's, it's good to fast. You know, we fast in our house every, every Friday before Sabbath, every preparation day, and then we leave Sabbath to be a day of feasting. All right? So I just wanted to clarify that. And um, I'll take uh, 651. Yes, ma'am. All right. 651-2791. Hello? Thomas Stalls. This is Tony Dickens. Oh, hey, Tony. How are you? I'm sorry. I thought you were past the Cox. Look here, man. I just want to say, I'll see you on the sea glass. I'll be there. We'll be walking the streets. We'll do some research. We'll, we'll walk around. We'll do our thing. So I just want to let you know, I will see you there along with anyone else. Awesome. You have a blessed day, brother. Hey, Tony, man, I appreciate hey, you. Hey, hey, good morning. Hey, hey, that's my sister. I want to say hi to Tony. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning, Tony. I want to be there, too, me and Mama. I'm here. Tony, we can get to know you better. Yes, I want to get to know you better. Tony, we can get to know you better. Hey, family. <laughs> Tony, we got to meet you on a virtual prayer line, but we're going to see you in heaven, my brother. You better. Tell how you been. I'm fine. Listen, I just want to give y'all the invitation. Y'all going to be at, 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 at my mansion. <laughs> I will feed guests of honor, God the Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Ghost. But y'all invited. Amen. Just so you know that. Amen. All right. Wow. It's good to hear your voice. Hey, hey Tony and Tommy, I especially love Dr. said. I, I love the version where it says mansions instead of rooms. Because rooms itself like a hotel. I don't understand. 
<laughs> yeah. How did this turn? Into, how did this turn into a family reunion? Right. <laughs> right. That's how it's gonna be in heaven. Yeah. That's what it's gonna be in heaven. Amen. Love y'all. All right. Hey, mom, I'm, I'm gonna go to the last caller. Okay, mom. All right. It's good to hear my mama's voice. She's gonna be there. God willing, I'm gonna be there too. I'm gonna be there too. Brother Jimmy, I see you've made it back. Let me see if I can unmute you, bro. Can you hear me? Brother Jimmy, we lost you the last time. All right, I unmuted you, bro. I unmuted you. So if you're there, Brother Jimmy, it's all on you now. <laughs> all right, so for whatever reason, he's there, but I, I, I can't hear him or he's not speaking. So with that being said, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I've enjoyed the transformation. Tomorrow we'll just do a recap. Hopefully everything will go well online. And I will post today's um, Bible study as quickly as we get off the line and I can download it. So let's just pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for a few moments to be in your word, to be transformed over 30 days. We, we ask for exponential blessings over 2019 that you expand our borders like you did for Jabez. And I pray, Father, for health. I pray for finances. I pray for good families. I pray that husbands will get along with wives and wives along with husbands and children and parents and bosses. I pray for all of those things, Father. I pray for health and prosperity. But more importantly than anything that can eventually be taken away from us, I pray for salvation. I pray for salvation, Father. I pray for one day to be able to walk on those golden streets, to one day be able to put my crown at your feet. We love you, Father, and we thank you for sending your son to die for us. And we ask all of these things in his holy name, Yahshua, amen, amen, and amen again. Well, everybody, today's call is officially over. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom for what will it profit any one of us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul. Until I meet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's call is officially over.